He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and American Meteorological Society. And he's also a former Fulbright scholar as well as a Guggenheim fellow. Um, notably, Peter was awarded the prestigious American Meteorological Society Stommel Award for outstanding contributions to the advancement of understanding the physics of the ocean. And Peter's research and teaching span a very broad range of topics. Um, Peter's very well known for, among many other things, his laboratory experiments for understanding fluid dynamics on a rotating planet. So we're very happy to have you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, the, uh, I haven't been to Yale for a long time, but I, my, I grew up in Connecticut, a little north of here, and most of my classmates went to Yale, which that's 21 of them, in fact, in my high school. And I was the black sheep that I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't want to be an investment banker. <laughs> but here I am back home, and it's really fun to see this, uh, uh, the great department uh, that I'm visiting in Klein Geology and the diversity of science here and really high quality stuff. You can all be proud of, what, of your environment and what you're doing. So. Um, I'm sorry, you know, the slides will be cut off in some ways. I hope it won't be too bad, but um, I wanted to start out showing this uh, through the cloud long wave radiometry that Tom Agnew of Environment Canada has produced for, the, um, for Arctic ice, and we're seeing through clouds to see the flow out of the Arctic down both sides of Greenland. And this is a sort of a running, uh, running theme through what I'm interested in today. And, uh, particularly the way that uh, fresh water um, impacts the, the oceans to the south. We're just north of the Labrador Sea and the northern Atlantic. So uh, these are my collaborators, Serba Hakkinen uh, at NASA, Nick Beard, my grad student, is just finishing at, uh, at uh, Seattle, and Charlie Erickson, who designed and built the sea gliders that I'll show you, Helena Langehaug in Norway, Jabi Oju in Florida State, Eric Chassignier, and Bill Schmitz, an old friend of mine from Woods Hole. And uh, so I'm, oh my, <laughs> let's see what we've got here. Um, well, we've got some, it's like a haiku, isn't it? You have to fill in. <laughs> the, uh, why are we interested in the subpolar zone, and especially in the North Atlantic? The, um, it has to do with people and ecos ecosystems, uh, natural resources. Everything is on the move. The uh, natives of the far north are, uh, have lived there so successfully for maybe 6,000 years, and yet their, their world is changing now. And uh, it's a concentrated region for the global climate system. It's the headwaters of the oceanic meridional overturning circulation, um, center of variability, decadal, multi-decadal. And uh, as one often hears, the Arctic Rim is where the cryosphere changes may have the greatest impact. And it's the leading edge of global warming. So that's lots of reasons to be working there. And uh, the, uh, this is kind of a list of things. Warning, this is not a technical talk on computer model building. And uh, I don't know quite how technical to be. I know many of your faces, but not all. And so I, this, I've got trying to do it tread a fine line between uh, a really technical lecture and one that's a little bit more general about the climate of the far north. Um, but what the, the subjects I'm interested in are, are uh, a, a set of examples, really, of, about the ocean circulation dynamics at high latitude, particularly in the Atlantic, and particularly to do with fresh water and, and uh, ice dynamics. And, uh, uh, the, both the overturning uh, circulations of the Atlantic and the lateral gyres, which are mostly driven by wind, heat content and circulation of, and modes of variability, and possibly active feedbacks to the atmosphere and atmospheric circulation. So uh, starting with freshwater and ice dynamics, um, it's good to remember that density stratification is, is really one of the absolutely most important variables in the ocean for its impact on ecosystems and uh, and uh, heat transport and many other things. Density stratification, temperature, and, uh, uh, and the way it controls circulation. So um, this uh, is the 
<laughs> at least part of the global ocean circulation is seen by GRACE gravity satellites and altimetry from satellites and surface drifters all put together, in this case by the Aviso group in France. The, uh, these contours are contours of sea surface elevation relative to the geoid, a mean time average uh, over the 1990s. And you can see the, the subtropical and subpolar gyres of the Pacific. Uh, here are a cyclonic anti-clockwise gyre and here a, a anti-cyclonic clockwise gyre, if I said that right. And in the Atlantic, similarly, uh, beautifully, well, one, one still has questions of accuracy, of course, but the, we're homing in, the community is homing in more and more accurately on this, on this field, which has to be the reference field for satellite altimetry. And in the Atlantic, uh, which we'll focus on, uh, that little yellow bar is in the, crossing the Labrador Sea. It's a repeat section from the Canadian group in uh, eastern Canada, the uh, AWOS section, AR7W. And uh, the, the blue Labrador Sea there is a cyclonic gyre, um, very small but very important. In, in its, it's one of the densest surface water sites in the world ocean where the atmosphere can talk to the deep ocean, so to speak, and uh, isopycnal surfaces, constant density surfaces that rise up and deep convection to two and a half kilometers often occurs there and, uh, and sometimes doesn't. And further south is the familiar Gulf Stream system, and it's, oh my golly, I have to be careful whether I'm clicking or pointing. Uh, I don't see a pointer here, actually. That's one of my problems, but um, the, uh, this, <laughs> the Gulf Stream system, uh, this is, again, the time average uh, geostrophic flow field for that system, and uh, you can see that it's both uh, a gyre, but it's also reaching up into the northern realm uh, carrying, and it's of course part of the overturning circulation, bringing warm water to the far north, which uh, is of, of great interest to us. So if we do a, a cross section on that yellow um, line across the Labrador Sea, this is what the salinity field looks like in 2002 in the spring. And uh, you can see uh, a little bit of confusion there, but largely that you have um, salty water in the at depth and uh, fresh water starting at uh, 12 or 1400 meters uh, and then above in the sort of cyan color. And then the deep blue color is buoyant low salinity water floating over the top of the Labrador Sea. And it's come off of the boundary currents in West Greenland. And uh, it's an important part of the talk because it's such a fine scale feature, a delicate feature, uh, and yet it has a lot of integrated buoyancy in it, and so it's, it's like a blanket lying over the top of the sea, insulating it from the atmosphere. The atmosphere has mixed down, um, I'm trying to be gentle here and just point, mixed down uh, that far in the winter deep convection, the cold Arctic air flowing out from Canada, uh, sometimes, as I said, reaching 2,500 meters depth, creating uh, new water masses and creating a, a significant part of the uh, overturning circulation of the entire Atlantic, one, one of the components of North Atlantic deep water. But it has to fight against the, the net buoyancy on the top. And, uh, and so this is where climate models and, and uh, other models begin to disagree. And it's where uh, you have to get out there and uh, kind of measure stuff and not just uh, run models. So, oh, thank you. Oh, that's so great. I feel better. So this is what you have to do sometimes in the Labrador Sea to, in order not to capsize, to keep the ice uh, off your ship, at least for fishing boats. This is the NOR, a larger uh, Woods Hole oceanographic vessel. But um, uh, we d we've done a lot of that work uh, with the Canadians making those sections, and people like John Lazier of Canada have, have created wonderful time series, which are, as years go by, they become more and more important. The endurance of oceanographers who keep going out and resampling again and again builds up. So after a decade or so, you begin to really speak to the entire climate community. And that's the value of these difficult cruises and in difficult weather. Uh, but we do have modern technology, and so some of us, particularly those of us who are aging, might want to stay home instead and uh, just send your robots out there. So this is a sea glider from Charlie Erickson at University of Washington who uh, took a fanciful tale of Henry Stommel, our, one of our greatest of oceanographers, written many years ago and built this autonomous undersea vehicle which does hydrography 
measures oxygen, measures velocity, measures um, particle scattering, fluorescence, bio biological quantities. And it's uh, self-propelled and talks to, phones home three times a day. Uh, a thousand meters. The, the, new, the, uh, the new version, glider, Sea Glider 2, will go to 6,000 meters, and, and that's about as deep as you need to go. It looks a little like an narwhal, which they live in the same region. And uh, I'll be talking about these tomorrow over in Klein Geology a little bit more. And, uh, but uh, the, so you've got a robot, you've got the problem to solve, and you, but you need people and collaborators. So we've kind of worked with a wonderful high latitude network of people and oceanographers and sites to launch gliders from, uh, from Nuuk, the capital of West Greenland, or capital of Greenland, to Reykjavik, to the Faroes, to Bergen, Norway, to Stockholm, to uh, Oban, Scotland. And uh, this network, every one of these little islands or big islands has oceanographers and environmental scientists on it. And we've had a wonderful, a wonderful time uh, working with people in all of these places to uh, because they're hydrographers, they're great, they're great people to work with. And when we had a government, we were funded by these people, and we hope we will again. So the, we put the sea gliders in. This was the first major trial of, uh, sea trial of sea gliders uh, in back uh, in 2003. And we've been constantly for uh, most of the last 10 years working in the northern Atlantic with these uh, robots. And this is a track of two sea gliders, number four and number eight, uh, over uh, October through February, the winter of that, at that uh, time. And there, there were, we launched them 100 kilometers offshore in, in, in between two very strong uh, storms uh, in a small boat. And they chugged southward 1,000 kilometers or so, and then continued to survey north and south and across. This is the line of hydrography that I showed you a minute ago. The, ver the, the vectors are the, the depth of average velocity of the, of the ocean. Um, and um, the glider also measures the surface velocity and uh, vertical velocity. So we have a lot of interesting variables to come home with. But um, what I mostly want to show you is just one, one set of data that comes out of this, that program. This is the, the region seen as ocean color. And uh, if I home zoom in on the central basin of the uh, subpolar gyre here, and there's Greenland in the region that we're working in with the gliders, Labrador Sea now. This is the spring bloom of phytoplankton. And not coincidentally, it's happening in uh, just the region we're working and just the region that has that freshwater layer on it. Excuse me, how did that happen? Um, what you see here as an overlay is um, the sea surface temperature from satellite. And the, the blue region is a cold tongue coming out from the coastal current, uh, the deep, and both the deep and the shallow coastal current of West Greenland streaming out over the top of the Labrador Sea. And these are the tracks of two sea gliders in that plume at that time. And uh, so what we measured there is the, is the uh, detail of the freshwater cap that, that I showed you on the long section. And uh, the, uh, it's both a, a jet of circulation, which is the part of the subpolar gyre, the cyclonic subpolar gyre of the region, deciding to uh, separate from the western boundary and flow over across to Labrador. And that, that actually happens in two branches, one further up near Baffin Bay. And uh, so this is the same picture again with the buoyant low salinity layer floating on top. And uh, what, what th having the in situ uh, measurements uh, from the gliders and from these sections, allow, it allows you to quant quantify the amount of buoyancy in this region and then develop an idea both of the structure of the, of the offshore circulation, which is shown here. Here we're, we're, we're repeatedly sampling one of those eddies. And you see this is the center of the eddy and this is the uh, azimuthal velocity. It's an eddy re that reaches down uh, eight or 900 meters and uh, is more or less symmetric, uh, anticyclone. And this on the, on the right side is the half image of the salinity field. So you see the freshwater blanket that I mentioned and we've seen, but also it's carrying warm, old, tired old Gulf Stream water from the Erminger Sea uh, down below. <clears throat> but it's that uh, extra buoyancy at the top which is so influential. Uh, if we add up the buoyancy and, uh, for one of these thousand kilometer long tracks of the gliders, the uh, 
the buoyancy is very high where you have a lot of fresh water in the Davis Strait. We come southward and it becomes essentially zero where you're having deep convection, and this is in wintertime. We've lost the time scale, I'm sorry to say, but uh, this is deeply convecting here, so there's no buoyancy barrier. But then we pick it up again as we head south towards Labrador, and the salinity contribution to it is dominant. So what we get in the end is a map uh, gradually filled in of where, uh, where this buoyant blanket exists. And what, and what happens is that the offshore flow carries the the uh, fresh water out to the southwest and leaves open just a small region where deep convection can, can occur with great ease without the barrier. So instead of when the cold Arctic Canadian air streams across the Labrador Sea, you would normally expect, and, and indeed a cl many climate models expect, that the whole region will convect deeply. But this uh, intervention of, uh, of Arctic water uh, prevents that and creates about a 100 kilometer region where deep convection occurs in the mean. So that's a, a first listen. The question, what does that have to do with climate models? The point is they have to resolve some of these effects because these, uh, they have, these uh, events uh, in a way are greatly influential or maybe even controlling over the uh, water mass transformation in the region, creation of Labrador seawater, that cold fresh water you saw in the section. And that in, in, in uh, in a real measure affects the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation because this is a, Labrador seawater is, a, is one of the, the, the three major components of North Atlantic deep water, the, the deep water mass of the oceans. So, and uh, so that's part of the title of my talk, what climate models have to learn from, uh, learn about the subpolar ocean. And what you'll hear me say later in the talk uh, is that uh, we need, to somehow learn to insert these fine scale features like that uh, advected uh, thin layers of buoyancy into climate models, even though their resolution can't be high enough to resolve them completely. And we can do that by using um, neighboring high resolution ocean models. So that's where we're headed. Farther south where the Gulf Stream sends warm subtropical waters northward, that's the opposite part of the conveyor belt, the warm water going up to feed the, feed the sinking cooling waters of the north. Uh, there's, also, there's also great heat loss to the atmosphere in winter, so it's not just in the Labrador Sea. This is a global map of the mean upward heat flux uh, from ocean to atmosphere from uh, uh, British NOC data, Simon Josie et al. And the red regions are where warm ocean is warming the atmosphere and being cooled by the atmosphere. And it's not surprising where they are, the Kurashio and the Gulf Stream, but it's, uh, very important to see how far northward this region of ocean heating the atmosphere extends, right up to the Barents Sea. The Barents Sea is miraculously ice-free, even though it extends up almost to 78 north or 76 degrees north. Very high latitude sea, but it's ice-free. And therefore, uh, because of this, the combination of ocean and atmosphere storm track carrying warmth northward, it, it maintains that uh, free surface and hence it's interaction with the atmosphere. So if we kind of zoom in a little bit on the Atlantic and uh, think about not only the Labrador Sea where we just have been, but this extremely strong track of, of ocean warmth just rounding the corner here uh, east of Newfoundland. Um, here are a 300 year time mean uh, pictures from two couple climate models. I won't name them, but if you look hard, you can probably see what they are. But uh, there, this is the IPCC class. The IPCC report just came out last week with a new uh, story about our climate system and its changes. A, a wonderful document, I'd say. Um, but the, the, the models which are feeding that report so heavily are, have, do have coarse resolution in both o ocean and atmosphere. And so they, they really are struggling to resolve some of the effects that we're talking about. Now the warm Gulf Stream, um, effect, which I just, we just looked at, is totally absent from this model and uh, more or less absent from this model here. These, this is the upward buoyancy flux on, me, on mean from these two models. And so it should be compared with this, these pictures here. And uh, it's not red enough. And the reason is um, there's the ice models in these are not quite right. And so you get a blanket of anomalously fresh water, low salinity water, streaming out of the Labrador Sea 
and, and making that blanket again. So the blanket is not where it should be, but it is where it shouldn't be. And uh, the, cru the crucial excitation of the atmosphere by the warm ocean is, is missing in that model, in these two models. And uh, so that's interesting uh, and something to work on and diagnose the, really the geography of where uh, heat and fresh water are moving in the system is what we need to keep better track of. But Excuse me? Uh, they were, the difference is that one was run by Norwegians and the other by the French. <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference. You know, there, there are a large number of, of uh, this is from a paper by Helena Langehaug and uh, Tora Eldevik and myself comparing three of these IPCC models with, uh, uh, with observations. And uh, now, so the question is, um, the next question is, does this matter? I mean, is it important if, if all you care about is the atmosphere and weather in Europe or weather in Canada or US, is it important that, that the models are struggling to, to get these details right? And uh, one very closely related thing is that uh, this, this uh, error I've just showed you is a cold bias of climate models and it's widely present. And uh, it arises, well, I said it was because of the ice, uh, the ice effect, but it's another effect as well that the, um, the observed Gulf Stream turns left here and becomes the North Atlantic Current and heads up to do its work in the far north. But the, the, the coarse resolution models can't make that turn and so their Gulf Streams tend to go across towards Europe and they, that leaves a cold bias in the sea surface, an, an error where the sea surface has not been warmed by the Gulf Stream, yet it should have been. And uh, Adam Scaife at, uh, at London has explored this and he simply said, well, let's remove the cold bias and see how the, every, keep everything else the same in these models, the same atmosphere, and see what happens. And so he increased his ocean model to, um, well, a quarter degree resolution, which gave it a good enough, a better Gulf Stream track. It turned left here and went up further north rather than gliding uh, more towards the UK. And this is the change in the, um, in the, surface temperature that resulted. So he, could, he was able to remove the cold bias simply by uh, moving the Gulf Stream North Atlantic current system to where it should be. And what did that do? Well, what happened was that atmospheric blocking frequency went from much too rare here, and this is uh, the Atlantic sector here between the Greenwich Meridian and uh, say 50 West. So here is what the models were doing for episodes of blocking in, in wintertime. And here was the uh, observations from ERA 40 or something like that. And here is the, the model with a corrected uh, cold bias, with the cold bias removed. So it was vastly improved, at least, uh, at least halfway improved by doing this. And so that's a, that's a serious question because we know the ocean and the mean affects the climate system of the Earth. The climatological mean, there's no doubt about that both in the tropics and in these high latitude regions. But what we don't know is whether there's a lot of feedback interaction so that changes, small subtle changes in the ocean possibly can make great changes in the atmosphere. That's really an ongoing, constantly changing debate um, and very model dependent. But by changing, you see this uh, cold bias was about between three and four degrees. Uh, maybe a little higher at the, at the center. And so you might say, well, that's a lot of correction. And we don't have that in, in natural fluctuations. This is a correcting a model error. It's not changing. It's not watching the ocean change. But however, that's not quite true. Because, um, well, uh, let's see. Because the ocean actually can present uh, sea surface temperature changes of that same magnitude, which I'll show in a minute. Before I do, I forgot I wanted to tell you what blocking is. It, I mean, it's a, it's a word that meteorologists know about, but many, many of us don't really. And um, this is from a paper we wrote in Science about this effect. And atmospheric blocking, and this, this is a News and Views by Tim Wollings, one of the real experts on the jet stream from uh, Oxford, England. Uh, the normal jet stream in, in the upper troposphere is, is along this storm track, and it, of course, shifts up and down the Atlantic according to some decadal variability and shorter term variability, North Atlantic oscillation and the like. Uh, but when it is unhappy, it develops these huge meanders the way the Gulf Stream does really. 
And sometimes they bend back on themselves and form a dipole vortex pair, which just kind of sits in place for three to five days or even longer. And, and this, this is trying to swim upwind, so to speak, and it can sit there and, in this case, bring cold air down from the north right over the UK and down to Spain in this uh, cartoon. So blocking is a high amplitude meander of the jet stream, a very energetic feature, and uh, tends to happen when the uh, jet stream is uh, in the south. And in severe winters, which we've had many of recently in Europe, uh, well, they are blocked. We may be blocked here until spring. This is somewhere in southern Europe. I can't remember. Oh, Serbia. He's looking at an icicle in Serbia, which you don't normally see. And uh, so we, there have been some very severe winters, and, and there's a, the impacts of blocking are very strong. In, in the winter of uh, 2005 and 6, this is, the, uh, this is the episodes of blocking from January, um, January through February through March. So you see each one of these is a blocking period, and uh, that can add up to a very severe winter downstream of the block. Well, Serpa Hakan and uh, working w with me, it was really her idea, was to uh, uh, take a new product from NCAR, which is a reanalysis of the whole 20th century's weather in the middle of the troposphere, the 500 hectopascal height. And that was done by taking surface data back through, I think, 1870. Uh, hard to believe, really, that you could know what the jet stream was doing in 1870 or 1920. But the jet stream communicates to the ground very effectively. If you've experienced a cold air outbreak in, in uh, Texas or Oklahoma, you know what the jet stream is doing. And uh, what we have now from Campo et al. at NCAR is a Real analysis, and I'm really sorry that the time scale is lost here. This is, um, this is 1900, and this is 2010. So this is 110 years of blocking uh, occurrences in the uh, European, in the Atlantic sector. And you see there's variability, significant uh, between 10 and 20 percent variations in the occurrence of blocking in the wintertime. In the 1930s, this is the 1930s here. And this is the recent period from 1990s to the present. So something as high frequency as this violent weather kind of breaking of a jet stream wave actually come in clusters, which do have an interannual or even century-long time scale. So that's exciting. And what, uh, what we did was superimpose on top of that curve uh, the, an index of the warmth of the North Atlantic. And that's the red curve here. It has, uh, the raw data is the dashed mauve curve, which includes a global warming kind of trend over, you see this is the time scale here, 1900 through 2010, finally showing. But the, uh, the so-called AMO index of the warmth of the entire North Atlantic Ocean is, has itself an early 20th century warming in the 1930s, and then a dip in a, some uh, extra activity around 1960, 1980, but then a persistent second major warming right up until the present. And there's some, this is very low statistical reliability, I, I, I admit completely, but there's some feeling that these go together, that warm ocean and, high, and frequent episodes of blocking are somewhat correlated. And we just saw an example where the cause and effect can be actually found in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in numerical experiments by SCAFE. Well, the warm period of the earliest 20th century is one of the great mysteries of climate science. It was really before the full impact of greenhouse uh, gases was so strong as it is now. And uh, if I've got, I'm not sure I have this number right, but I think it's 500,000 tons of cod were caught in the, in the Labrador Sea west of Greenland, and there are no cod there now. And there generally are not cod there. They spawn off of Iceland and are advected in the ocean circulation to the Labrador Sea. And they were, happily, they were happy as clams, you might say, in the warmth of the uh, early 20th century, starting in the late 1920s and extending really till 1955 or so. So there was a huge cod harvest there, many indications of this warming and not just uh, rumor or uh, uncertain temperature thermometers, but lots of proof that that was real. And uh, so here we are in the recent heavily instrumented period since 1990 or so, this period of Earth's of satellite altimeters and Argo floats and GRACE gravity satellites and, 
uh, wonderful uh, global observing system for the ocean which we now have. And so we have, I'd, I'd say one of the challenges in our science, really big challenge is, you know, if we're going to really persuasively predict the 21st century's climate, we have to be able to understand this major early 20th century warming and what's happening right now. And there's some very good ideas. I won't have time today to talk, to sort through the thoughts about why this happened so long ago. And, uh, but you know, the, it was the time of the Dust Bowl in central US, strong cold air outbreaks from the north and uh, drought for 10 years. A lot of crazy things were happening back in this period. And uh, it's not at all clear what the prime mover of that was. But we're now in this heavily instrumented period so we can, we can talk at least about what the details of the current warming uh, are. So I'm gonna move into this area of uh, late 20th century, early 21st century oceanography. I'm sorry again, I apologize about the lost text up here. But this is uh, Penny Holiday from uh, the UK uh, and, and many other people have collected temperature records and we've lost the time scale, but this is um, roughly 1980 through 2010. And these are temperature records all the way from uh, Barents Sea, uh, Fugloya, Bear Island, this is in the Barents Sea entrance, uh, Norwegian Sea south to Norway, southern Norwegian Sea, uh, Faroe Islands, uh, Faroe Shetland Channel, Rockall Trough is west of Ireland. So this is going from north to south and you see over time this very strong warming and, and the magnitude from the cold to the warm is of order three degrees in many places or more. So that experiment of Adam Scaife's I showed you was not all, uh, out of the ballpark of natural variability. We've, we're subjecting the, uh, the ecosystems of the ocean and the atmosphere to uh, really unprecedented, unprecedented warmth until you go back to the 1930s. And the salinity field is carrying along a similar track, saltier and warmer, but uh, heat wins and it's, uh, the water is less dense than it was. So, oh my golly. Um, this is very big. Um, what, what's been going on in this period is quite uh, interesting. Um, since 1992, when the, when the satellite altimetry network was established, we, have, we can graph 20 some years, 21 or two years of the history of the upper ocean circulation as seen by satellite altimeters. And what Serpa and I did here was to find the principal uh, empirical orthogonal function of the variability of this northern Atlantic region. This is the shape of that function, but it's not, uh, you don't have to even think about EOS, just think of it as mostly a trend from 1992 here to 2011. Uh, this, uh, this downslope here is, amounts to a slowing of the subpolar gyre and a, a rising of the sea surface because it's a, it's a, a dish of a, a low of pressure, a low of sea surface elevation here. So it's been rising and slowing, and this has been falling and slowing in parts of the, of the Gulf Stream North Atlantic current system. It's, it's tricky because the Gulf Stream transport does not seem to have changed over near where Tom Rossby uh, has his, uh, his ship-based time series at the same, same time interval. Uh, so it's, and the, down in the Florida Straits, the transport of the Gulf Stream does not seem to have very much interannual or decadal variability. But up here where it's recirculating and where it's deciding whether or not to go north, it does seem to have changed and uh, remarkably so over this many years. So this is coincident with that period of warming and so we have to figure out what, what is the connection between the two. An altimeter measures the sea surface elevation and it's sort of a Swiss army knife of ocean instruments because it uh, the height of the sea surface is partly the, ocean, the heat content, it, you know, thermal expansion. There are other things there like salinity and fresh water and non-heat related things uh, affecting the sea surface elevation, uh, but it's fairly highly correlated. And so this actually is, is coincident with the warming of the region that we just showed. It's not, the, it's not actually a heat map, but it's suggestive and I'll show you the actual heat map. Um, this is the global uh, ocean heat content difference uh, integrated from the surface down to 700 meters. So it's the upper uh, 
quarter or fifth of the ocean, but it's the most active thermally. Uh, the difference from 1992 to 2010. So these are warming regions. If you average over the entire globe, that's, the, that's global warming, right? I mean, more than 90%, as you'll read in the new IPCC documents, more than 90% of the excess heat gained by the Earth system has gone into the ocean, very much less in the land surface and the atmosphere. And so if you integrate average over this all, you get a curve which looks like this. This is the heat content of the world ocean estimated by very careful and hard work, starting with Sid Levitas and many, many brilliant people working to get this curve right between 1992 on the left and 2010 on the right. Basically, the rising of the, rising of the heat content of, due to global warming. And you notice there's no hiatus here. We're getting incredible flack from people who don't believe in any human impacts on global climate um, because they say, well, you know, what happened the last 12, 15 years? It stopped. I mean, so it's not real. Humans don't do anything. Because surface temperature of the atmosphere is a quirky statistic, and there's so much geography, which you, say, which you see here, all this ups and downs, making that single number. I think the ocean is a really good thermometer for the climate system, and it doesn't seem to have that hiatus, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, this is a beautiful figure. It shows the depth of penetration of this heat uh, versus latitude. The, the very deep, dominated by the northern Atlantic, really, this, this dominant thing here. Not showing quite so clearly here is the, is the Western Pacific, which is a, a big positive region for sea surface height change. And uh, I said they're correlated, the heat content and the elevation of the sea surface, but the, that correlation is a little bit lost there. And so the, the islanders in the Western Pacific are, have been experiencing something like a meter of sea surface elevation change in, the, in recent decades. Is that the zonal I'm sorry? Is that the zonal average? This is the zonal average over the whole world. Yeah, just integrate this way. But this is the shape, and so we want to concentrate on that shape again. And um, here it is, uh, Serp and I have worked it out from another data set, and uh, 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 well, actually NODC data, zero to 700 meter heat content. Sorry, we've lost the surface, the uh, caption. But this is the change over uh, that same period, 19, no, uh, wait a minute. Let me get this right. Why does that, lost the time scale here. Um, 1993 to, Oh, I see. This is early 1990s uh, relative to 2007 to 2011. Sorry about that. So this is the warming that we're talking about. Notice how it wraps around the subpolar gyre as a beautiful way, suggesting that it's moving in part in the boundary currents that are cyclonically carrying it around. And it's got a big hole in the middle here, which is very surprising and uh, something we're trying to understand right now. But this is the close-in view, and with the vectors are the mean circulation according to uh, grace and altimetry in that region. So what you've seen uh, so far in the talk is the early 20th century warming here and uh, the current global warming here in the 1990s to 2000s. And uh, there, um, the surface signature of these is, is, uh, is defines what's called the AMO, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, AMO. I think it's much better to call it multi-decadal, uh, that's written wrong, multi-decadal variability rather than oscillation because it's really not a simple oscillator. But uh, this is the story of 20th century climate really in a nutshell. And uh, salinity, we've talked, we started the talk with fresh water and if you look at this uh, figure from Bob Dixon et al, uh, a meridional section of the change in salinity of the Atlantic you see it saltier in the upper density classes near the surface and in the, cent in the tropics and fresher in the high latitudes where we've been looking. So the hydrologic cycle, the, acceler the possible acceleration of the, uh, the increase of the hydro hydrologic cycle would 
is, is imprint is just this, more evaporation here becoming saltier, more precipitation and runoff, and possibly Arctic outflow making it fresher in the high latitudes. So these are all tremendously important indices. You'll see in the IPCC document a, a newer version of this figure uh, by other authors. But you can see how this is coming together as a dynamical and thermodynamical story, uh, a very exciting one to get right. And I'm going to finish the talk uh, fairly soon, but I want to uh, kind of, as I lead up to that, I, I, I hope I've convinced you that you need to know the structure and the shapes and distributions of these functions, and otherwise you just don't have anything uh, about the circulation and probably don't have very much about the climate. So we're looking at rather fine-scale detail that you get out of our modern global observing network out of robotic sea gliders and Argo floats and high resolution numerical models. And we somehow have to learn to um, input those into, re into improving the coarse resolution climate models. So these are the warm path uh, to the Arctic that I've been talking about. Here's the Gulf Stream again, turning left, uh, partly recirculating. It, it breaks into three branches here, a tight recirculation of the subtropical gyre going around and uh, a branch going as part of the warm meridional overturning up to the high latitudes. And the mixture of warm and cold waters uh, as, it, as it moves through the system de de decides the climate of the bio biologically active zones of the northern seas. And uh, so this little mixing valve here is all important and it's obviously a detail, you know, it's something you, you wouldn't be able to get right without some resolution. And so how do we do that? Well. Here's some resolution. This is uh, a close-in look at altimetric surface currents in that same region. Here we are, Gulf Stream turning left, going north. And here it is here in a snapshot, Gulf Stream turning left, going north. But this is a snapshot of one 10-day uh, period uh, in 2005. And uh, we may or may not uh, be able to animate this. This is the animation. The little time scale is going by up here. And uh, the Gulf Stream is, of course, wonderfully active. It's throwing off uh, meanders and eddies. There's a, something called the Man Eddy here, which is a little hard to see, but it's an anticyclone that, if you average this picture, there's an anticyclone sitting, sitting right here, east of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. And uh, here it is becoming the North Atlantic Current and carrying warm water, mixing in some unknown way with the uh, subpolar gyre up here, east of uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, and then turn around and carrying on. So it's obviously a complicated story to average over, but you know, you've got a model, you can, uh, this is data, this is observations, but you can now um, begin to approach this with high resolution numerical modeling. This is the time average of that picture, the man eddy, this huge anticyclone sitting there, confusing us terribly at, right at the, uh, and, and then the North Atlantic current, which turns east here, and the, the sort of mixing valve I suggested is operating all along here. There's cold, fresh Labrador current water just, uh, just inshore of the warm saline uh, subtropical water moving northward. So the mixing of those two is obviously very important. And the, um, a wonderful paper, I mean, our, our uh, theory of this thing is that that long period of slowing of the subpolar gyre has um, allowed the subtropical influence to uh, really dominate so that if we, if we have slowed this circulation, which we demonstrably have, we have the satellite altimetry is really very clear about that, then that suggests that um, this branch can become more influential in, in working on the eastern subpolar gyre. So that's as far as Serpa and I got. But then along came this a very interesting model study of, um, of Despriers, uh, Mercier, and Thierry of France. And what they did was take a one quarter degree numerical model and played the same game. They, they exposed it to observed atmospheric forcing and they looked at what was flowing into the north northern seas and they, they, they divided it into these streamlines coming from the warm subtropics and these streamlines recirculating from the cold northern gyre. So the sum of these two is what crosses this line here. And what they were, found was that as the subpolar gyre weakens, the flow south of 50 north, uh, everything in this 
period is actually decreasing. The, the overturning circulation is actually weakening in their calculation and probably in reality. And even so, the um, flow south of uh, the, this flow here, this warm water, is decreasing less in transport than the northern recirculation. And so there's less competition for the warm southern branch of the North Atlantic current and less dilution of its warmth. And so that's a, a, an entirely independent model study suggesting, I think, the same result uh, for the story of, uh, of this warm rim of the Labrador Sea and uh, this major climate event of the 20, 20th and early 21st century. Um, I'm coming close to the end here. I wanted to show that uh, we know, okay, what do we do about this uh, complexity that you seem to need to predict major climate changes in the northern Atlantic and in the atmosphere above? Um, what you have to do to start with is to map the diapycnal mixing, that is to say the transformation of warm waters into cold and salty waters into fresh or vice versa, that obviously uh, mixes water masses in the North Atlantic current. So what we've just seen um, is visible in this data here. It's actually model data from the HICOM numerical model. Um, it's a very small print up here describing what that's about. Uh, my collaborators at Florida State University, Jabi Oju and uh, Eric Chassignier and Bill Schmitz, what we've done is launch tracers in the Florida current and follow them through this complex, very rich, uh, unstable circulation. And that single point source down here to the left, uh, after five years, has spread itself through the subtropical gyre, the recirculation gyre, and fanned out across the northern uh, Atlantic. And after 10 years, even more so. So you might look at this and say, well, why did you need all that detail, all those eddies? Why don't you just put in a big diffusivity? And uh, well, that's the object, really, is to learn how to do that and, and get it right. But the, the net effect of the eddy, mesoscale eddy turbulence of the ocean is to make it very diffusive. And you can see that in this distribution of warmth as it reaches to the far north. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to do. Now, to do this quantitatively is some work. And the meridional overturning circulation of the oceans is almost always defined and described in terms of the, uh, the zonal average of the vertical and meridional velocity. So this slightly off-screen picture is the overturning of one of those climate models. It shows northward flow of warm water and sinking in the high latitudes, 65 north, and then flow back as cold overflows and cold Labrador seawater. And the other of those two models has a, a rather different but similar appearing overturning circulation. Now this is usually all you see from numerical models and climate models. But the trouble is you just can't diagnose anything from these figures. You have to go back and to the geography that we've described and uh, have a, some kind of a model dialogue to look at where this transformation of warm waters to cold occurs and match it to the air-sea flux of heat and fresh water. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make a theta S meridional overturning circulation, theta being potential temperature, S being salinity, and uh, it works I'd say impressively well, and uh, it tells you where the mixing sites in the ocean model are, and then you, we have a whole legion of uh, observers of mixing, turbulent mixing in the ocean who are beginning to fill in crisscross maps of where violent mixing actually does occur, and I'll talk actually some about that tomorrow in, in talking about sea gliders. But this is the upper uh, layers of the ocean. This, is, this red blob here is an expression of the wintertime convection transforming waters in the edge of the subpolar gyre, producing what's called subpolar mode water, and some transformation occurring in the boundary current. As you go down to deeper levels, you begin to encounter, uh, this is deeper densities, I mean higher densities, uh, deeper below the surface. You encounter Labrador Sea convection, which is cooling the water here, transforming it, uh, mixing in the boundary currents, these red and blue stripes here, and uh, mixing in the region we just looked at, this intense uh, western boundary current, Gulf Stream region. So this is where that, uh, uh, oh sorry, and, and further, one more layer down, we, uh, we encounter the opposite 
uh, tendency of, of the, uh, if, you con if you converge water into one density class, you diverge it from another, and that describes uh, mixing. And this is what the change in colors here represents. So we, we basically are, in this HICOM model, able to localize where water mass transformation occurs and turn that into a, a meridional overturning uh, described in the phase space of oceanography, which is the temperature and salinity coordinates. It, it includes the heat flux and the freshwater flux free for nothing once you've done that. So that's the, that I'm describing the beginning of a story, and I'll have to stop uh, just about now, but the, uh, I, hope, I, I hope you can appreciate how much you need to do that in comparison with this rather stripped down overturning circulation figures that we always see from zonal averaging because we just can't diagnose truth and uh, the truth value of those by themselves. So we want to reproduce the key climatological mean circulation, transports of heat and geochemicals, sites of transformation of water masses. And this involves upscaling from high resolution models and observations to coupled climate models, CCMs. And also diagnose the dominant variability events of the past 150 years and much further, and uh, particularly the early 20th century warming and the present Atlantic warming, which is the two major events of the last 150 years. So that's the goal. It's uh, not finished, but we do have now a global observing system for the ocean. Uh, the tower ray and the equator of moorings, the Argo floats 3,700, I think now, satellites scanning the earth for currents, temperatures, heat content, weather and the internet. Those are our, that's our modern observing system. And uh, I'll leave you with this image of the jet stream over the Atlantic. And these are blocking events, severe meanders of the jet stream, which cause Arctic air in, in, the, in their wake to come down and freeze the Europeans. Thank you. <laughs>